Hello, welcome again to another edition of Matters of the Heart, brought to you by Haverhill Community Television and Pawtucket Medical Associates. I'm Seth Belazarian, a cardiologist with PMA, and I'm joined today by uh, uh, an associate, Dr. Garrett Bamba, the medical director of Express Care at PMA. And I'm very fortunate to have Dr. Bamba. He's been uh, with Express Care for a year and a half. Uh, the program has been with us. He's a board-certified emergency room physician, and he's brought some new services and some new approaches to what was previously an urgent care program, now an express care, which is sort of halfway between urgent care and emergency care. Um, I'll let him elaborate more on that. But uh, today I asked Dr. Bamba to talk about uh, seasonal uh, questions of health and uh, we titled this show Bugs, Burns, and Barbecue to be alliterative. alliterative. And uh, Dr. Uh, Bamba tells me that he sees a lot of these problems that I was hoping he could teach me about and I'm sure the audience would be interested in. And that's mosquito bites and ticks, poison ivy, sunburns, and maybe some other topics will come up, but those four mainly. And Dr. Bamba says that a lot of questions on a lot of these, but he tells me a lot about ticks. But I'd like to start with the mosquitoes if I could. Sure. But maybe before that, did you anything that I, did I get anything wrong about Express Care and your involvement in the last year and a half? You didn't. So I've been at Express Care for a year and a half now. It was a walk-in center for approximately 10 years before I came. And uh, with my emergency medicine experience, I kind of ramped up the services a little bit. Not only do we take care of these minor uh, medical issues and injuries, now we can utilize x-ray, laboratory, uh, we can suture wounds, we can uh, cast uh, fractures, uh, we have MRI, ultrasound, CAT scan, so we're really doing a lot of good work there keeping people out of the emergency department. We also can give IV fluids, IV antibiotics for certain things, take care of dog bites, cat bites, so we're really doing good work keeping people out of the ER, right. out well, of the long waits. Well, you said dog bites and cat bites, so we use the bite to go to mosquito bites. And there what, we go. So mosquitoes, obviously, um, we're fortunate in our part of the world to not have a life-threatening mosquito illness a lot. There is some, but uh, malaria people know about from the world. Um, but we don't have malaria in the United States, fortunately. But we do have some. Uh, there's a mosquito illness that people are, I'm sure have heard about called Eastern Equine Encephalitis, or EEE, or Triple E. I think that's a, a, a mosquito-borne uh, illness, meaning that the mosquito is just carrying that virus from a horse to the human, so when the mosquito draws blood from us, th th we're infected with it. So that's mm -hmm. that's the concern. That's a, that's not very frequent. There's been very rare circumstances of that happening in Massachusetts, but it's some, a reason to be preventative. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about what you would recommend for people to think about for prevention with mosquitoes. So it's very true that you know that is very rare. Actually, 80% of the people that are actually uh, injected by the mosquito or bit by the mosquito with that virus never show any symptoms. So even if you were unlucky enough to get that very rare mosquito that had one of these viruses, whether it be Triple E or West Nile virus, um, you probably aren't going to show any symptoms. But I think that the symptoms to look for when you're bit by mosquitoes you know, you, or any other insect, you should always put that kind of in the back of your uh, brain uh, and remember that because if anything comes up in the next couple of weeks to months, you can tell your physician that, yes, I was bit by a mosquito or, yes, I was bit by a tick. When you say anything comes up, you mean like a, a more broad illness, a, what we might call a systemic illness. Exactly. So, for example, you talked about uh, the uh, triple E. You know, you, you look for high fevers, headache, neck pain, really signs of what you think of as meningitis, uh, confusion, um, and uh, that's when I really think you should, you know, seek medical care, probably in the emergency department, and get checked out to make sure you don't have uh, this illness. Okay. So that's mosquitoes. Let's talk a little bit about what people can do, either children or adults can do for prevention. What are, what are some recommendations there? So, of course, the summer is the big time where people are getting bit by mosquitoes, and some people, you know, can react pretty badly to mosquito bites. Some people are very allergic to them. They get big welts. I think that the, the number one thing that you should do is uh, avoid being outside, if you can, from dusk to dawn. If you can't do that, wear um, insect repellent. I think DEET is the big one, D-E-E-T. Uh, any product that has over 20% uh, DEET would be effective in keeping out, uh, keeping the bugs off of you. Obviously, uh, clothing, long clothing, long pants, long shirts will do that as well. I think if you go on the CDC website, which is a very good website, by the way, if you have any questions, uh, recommends that the, the DEET uh, that you do have in the product should be between 20 and 50%, and anything after 50% DEET uh, is really not that much more preventative. So um, anything between 20 and 50% is good. Okay, so that's mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. So let's talk. move on to the next topic that you told me off-air that a lot of attention is given to ticks. 
They are. I think people are frightened of ticks more than zombies okay. sometimes. All right. Well, zombies are pretty nerve-wracking too. They but, are. But let's just focus on ticks for this show. We'll okay. Do, we'll do a sort of show on <laughs> zombies at another time. So let's talk about ticks. So let's just break it down. Um, you know, I'm at home. A parent or, or an adult for themselves is worried. Let's just take uh, maybe a simple one to start with. I find a tick crawling on me or my, my beloved child. Mm -hmm. What do I need to do? Do I whisk them into the emergency room? What should I do there? No, if, if you find a tick just crawling on your child and it hasn't bit yet and you can't find any bite mark, I would just remove the tick from your beloved child, flush it down the toilet, or bring it outside if you don't want to kill an animal or an insect, I should say, and, uh, and then be done with it. Now, the, the problem is when you actually found, find that tick embedded in your skin. And a lot of people have a lot of anxiety about this. Um, I have so, so embedded in skin, let's just be clear, it means that it's, it's, it's adhered. You, you, you touch it, it's not moving, it's stuck. Exactly. Okay. So, it's, so it's actually bit you and it's holding on to the skin. Okay. Um, that's when you need to be concerned because now you know that there's a potential of transmission of certain bacteria from the tick into your, into your body. Yeah, so the, the analogy, we just talked about how the viruses that are, the mosquito carries, is, it's not really the mosquito that was doing the bad work, it's the virus. The, the, the mosquito, doctors call it a vector, it's just the carrying it. Exactly. So this is the same idea, the mosquito is actually carrying something that is potentially going to give us an illness that we're worried about. Of course, the illness that everyone has heard of is called Lyme disease. Yes, Lyme disease would be the big one. So, but ticks themselves, you know, they're a nuisance, but then themselves aren't really a big to-do. They're not, no, no. Very rarely do those bites become infected. Uh, people typically don't have too much of an allergy to the bite. And uh, what I would recommend if you are bit by a tick is to, to remove the tick and then... So uh, tell us a little bit about how one should do that. So a lot of people come into the, to the, either the emergency department or the urgent care and they come with the, stick still, the tick still embedded because they're worried about, you know, what if I do it the wrong way? What if I leave the quote unquote head in? Um, if you're bit by a tick, what I would recommend doing is uh, taking a pair of tweezers, if you have them, tweezers would be the best, getting it down as close to the head of the tick or closest to your skin as possible, and then just pull, remove the tick. And then after people do that, I also see people coming into the urgent care saying, well, I've done that part, the head is still in there, can you please get it out? So the CDC recommends that any part of the tick that's left within your skin be left there. It's not going to cause a problem. It's not going to increase your risk of Lyme disease or any other uh, bacteria that uh, you know, ticks carry. And it should just fall out on its own just like a small little splinter, and it shouldn't be a big deal. So a lot of the people uh, you know, want us to dig around for that, and we just leave them alone. We tell them to clean the area with alcohol after they remove the tick, and everything should be okay. Now, after the tick is removed, what do you do after that? You're obviously worried about Lyme disease. Now, just like you know, the, the mosquitoes, you, know, you have to get bit by a tick that has this organism in there, microorganism in there, to transfer to you. Now, I've been, been, been bit by ticks multiple times. I don't know if I've ever had Lyme disease. But there's always a chance. So when you're bit by a tick and you're worried about Lyme disease, if you're bit, Within 72 hours, you can seek medical care and get um, a prophylactic dose of an antibiotic. Now, if you're an adult, if you're over, I believe it's eight or nine years old, so I'm sorry, I shouldn't say just adult, but over the age of eight or nine uh, and bit by a tick within 72 hours, you can get a 200 milligram dose of doxycycline, which will prevent, it basically prophylaxes you against Lyme disease. So it's a one tablet, one dose? It's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a one-time dose of antibiotic. Now you said, I want to be clear what you said, so 72 hours, that's three days, meaning yep. that if, you, if it's highly likely that the tick has been embedded for three days, what did you mean when you said 72 nope. hours? Uh, so 72 hours, so say that um, you went... You went on a hike on Saturday. You went on a hike on Saturday. Right. On Monday, you found a tick uh, on your thigh. Right. You were indoors the rest of the, the weekend because it was pouring rain. So you got it on Saturday, you show up by Tuesday, we're within that 72-hour window that we assume the tick could have bit you at okay. first, and then you can get that prophylactic dose. Of okay. Now, I'm, at one point, the recommendation, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the likelihood of Lyme is very low if you have high degree of confidence that the tick has been embedded for less than 24 hours. Um, I think it's 40. It could be 24. I thought it was 48 hours. That's very true. But um, so to use the analogy on the Saturday hike. Mm -hmm. If Sunday morning while taking a shower you discovered the tick, you're clearly within a 24 hours. Your likelihood of Lyme is very low to just try to reassure that there are some things. Getting the tick off earlier is really a good thing to do. Very true. Okay. 
and then talk a little bit about there's a reaction. You mentioned with mosquitoes there may be a reaction on the skin. Mm -hmm. Of course, any bug bite, we've, we've had some kind of a foreign body on our skin. People worry about different kinds of rashes and reactions that might signal something serious or not serious. What, what kind of things can people say, I can wait this out again with regard to the tick reaction? Over to the, uh, coming over to the studio today, I actually had a phone call from a friend up north uh, who asked me exactly that. I, ha I think I was bit by a tick two days ago. I have this rash on my ankle. What do you think? So I'm actually going to see him tomorrow, so it's going to so, be easy. So this reaction on the ankle for this example you're saying, is it local to where the tick was or somewhere remote to where the tick was? Local to where the insect was. Okay. He's not exactly sure if it was a tick or not. Okay. Um, so, but, uh, you know, if you're bit by a mosquito or some other sort of insect, your skin is going to react in an, an allergic kind of way, so you're always going to, you, you always have to assume you're going to have some sort of redness, maybe a little bit of swelling there, um, and in, in that area it would probably be itchy. Um, Benadryl is usually very good for that. Over-the-counter, you know, topical steroid creams like Cordaid would probably help that out quite a bit. Now, we're talking about um, ticks. The rash that we worry about with ticks, it's, it's, typ it's uh, typically called a target lesion, and it doesn't necessarily need to be where the tick bite was. Uh, target lesion looks like it's a small little area of very dark red surrounded by a very clear area, so skin colored, and then surrounded by a more light red, almost like cellulitic or sunburn kind of red. And that, so uh, we refer to this as a bullseye. A bullseye, exactly. Yes. Okay, and what should someone do in that circumstance? In that case, that, that uh, kind of clinches the diagnosis for Lyme disease, and if a physician or a patient sees that, they should be treated for Lyme disease without any testing. Okay. So if we could just make sure that I understand what the recommendation is. So if someone, uh, just to summarize what I think you taught us, is that if you find a tick on you and it's not embedded, get rid of the tick in any way you want, but you are at no risk and no further attention is necessary. As soon as that tick is identified, you really should try to get it off and use either tweezers or your fingernail. Many people who are pet owners know about how taking a tick off. Just try to get as close to the skin as you can and get it out. If you feel like there's some residual left in, clean it with alcohol and give it some time. Mm -hmm. if, it, if you have that reaction, though, I, what I heard you say is that if you had the reaction and you know it's within the last 72 hours that the tick has been embedded, a short course of di di dicloxacillin to prevent Lyme disease is appropriate. So is that something someone should come in to express care for? I would. If you're concerned about uh, getting Lyme disease uh, and it's been within 72 hours, I think it's fairly reasonable to get the 200 milligrams of doxycycline. Okay. And then the last thing I think you told me is, is heightened concern for systemic illness, either sort of joint aches, feeling generally unwell, or this so-called bullseye or target lesion is something that really does require attention because that is therefore moved from a concern about Lyme to really this actual infection with Lyme. Absolutely. Fevers, okay. headaches, malaise, or, or just fatigue, joint aches, and of course that, you know, that bullseye lesion or target lesion is very um, concerning for Lyme disease. And, if, and again, I've, I've always said remember if you were bit by an insect because you may want to tell your physician about that in weeks to come if, in fact, you, know, you develop some of these symptoms, uh, your doctor can you know, check for Lyme. And you gave us some good strategies for prevention with mosquitoes, almost, I would think, pretty much a similar kind of uh, recommendations for ticks with long clothing. And, but the one thing we didn't say for mosquitoes, but we should say is, is very close inspection after you've been in the woods, I think, is probably something. When you take a bath, really sort of go over your body. And again, dog owners like myself know that it's sort of in the spaces, in the grooves of our legs or in the grooves under our arms is where ticks like to be. So those areas really need to be inspected. Absolutely, especially after you're in the woods or, you know, wooded or, or, or leafy. Area. Okay. Have we beaten up the topic of ticks? Are there any things that people ask you when they see you that we should tell our audience about? I would just say if you get bit by a tick, take it off yourself. Watch for signs of infection. If it's in within 72 hours and you're worried about Lyme disease, um, see your physician and they can give you the prophylactic dose of antibiotics. Okay, great. Thank you on that. So let's move on then to another topic which you told me you often see and I know I, I pl I'm plagued by in the summer and that's poison ivy or mm. broadly doctors would call them plant dermatitis, meaning mm -hmm. you get a reaction to some plant on your skin is derm and itis is inflammation. So you have an inflammation on your skin from some plant, mm -hmm. poison ivy, poison oak, poison sumac. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll just skip ahead and say prevention is good here. Stay away. Keep yourself covered. If you think you've been exposed, wash the area thoroughly to try to get the oils off. 
But that's it. That's all I know. What else can what, what can people do when they come in? Well, that's all you can really do to prevent it from happening. And then, and of course, you get it. And then what do you do? Well, a lot of people use Caladryl, which I think in some cases, you know, can dry it up a little bit, stop the, the spread of the rash and help with the symptoms a little bit. Uh, I think that uh, antihistamine uh, would certainly help. Benadryl will always help the itching. And then possibly some over-the-counter steroid creams could help as well. The problem is if you have that resin uh, or the oils, as you said, uh, from the plant on your skin, you can actually spread it with any topical uh, ointment that you're going to put on. So you have to, if you're very allergic to the, um, that oil, be very careful of spreading it to other areas. Uh, so I'd say Benadryl for the itching, topical steroid cream if you'd like, um, and then um, and the Caladryl to keep it dry. Yeah, I guess just a personal anecdote would be that I find that um, I've been better in my older years for two things, being very cautious with the animals because the animals get exposed to it. Absolutely, and, and then, rub against it and then rub then, against it. And you. then I give them a nice big hug and I get it from them. And the second thing is if I am been in the woods, uh, the clothes go immediately in the laundry because I think I get it on the my tops of my shoes and the legs of my pants. So I just get those off and wash them and I've been much more successful at, at reducing the likelihood of it. Um, so is there a situation in which someone should be more concerned, um, you know, someone has, uh, involvement in the face or anything where you would be more aggressive than just those things you described, Caladryl or mm -hmm. topical steroids? Yeah, if, if uh, it, certainly if it spreads around the eye, sometimes it can certainly get into the eye itself. It can get into the mouth. We worry about those two places in particular. Anything around the groin uh, can obviously be very, be very uncomfortable and, and cause some problems. So if it becomes, uh, if it gets to the point where it either reaches one of those areas or it just gets so diffuse that we can't control it anymore, we'd put people on uh, oral steroids. So a pill of steroids? An actual pill of steroids, usually prednisone in a taper okay. uh, for 10 to 14 days depending on the physician and uh, usually within you know, 24 to 48 hours you, know, you notice a significant so really difference. So really knock down the inflammation that exactly. the body's experiencing. From right. that. Okay, great. Anything else that we should cover on the poison ivy topic? I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. So another topic that we talked about is that, you know, you sometimes see patients who have unfortunately um, been in the sun too long. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes f someone fell asleep in the sun, they went to the beach, or they weren't properly protected, or sometimes, unfortunately, alcohol is involved, so someone was drinking and fell asleep in the sun. So uh, what some things, you know, prevention, of course, don't do that. Mm -hmm. But if someone's in that circumstance, what, when, when should somebody worry more about coming in versus just toughing it out at home? Well, I would talk about prevention first. You know, if you know you're going to spend the day outside on a, on a sunny day, and even a partly cloudy or a cloudy day, those UV rays, I mean, that's what we're worried about, those UV rays are still going to come through that cloud cover. So I would say 30 minutes before you get out or you start your drinking or whatever you're going to be doing, uh, apply uh, some sort of sunscreen. Now, they, they talk about, I remember... I think it's my wife who believes that anything over SPF 55 doesn't, you know, it's, it's, it's not any stronger if it's over SPF 55. Well, I actually went on to, in, to prepare for this talk with you, the CD web, CDC website, to see exactly what are the numbers. Okay. And they say that the SPF 15 blocks 93% of the UV rays that will hit your skin, which I think is pretty good. Uh -huh. And they said that... Um, uh, SPF 30 will block 97 percent and okay. that the CDC doesn't recommend anything higher than that because 97 percent is good enough. Now anecdotally I would say when I go on my vacation in January and I'm white as a ghost and I sit outside you know by the pool I will get burned if I don't have you know whatever the 90 or whatever I'm wearing that uh -huh. the highest dose of uh -huh you know, uh, sunscreen that I could possibly have. But they say 30 is, is good enough. They say to um, apply it every two hours. More, of course, depending on the activity you're doing, uh, perspiration or being in the water is going to limit the effectiveness of it. And we were talking about mosquitoes before. Uh, if you apply uh, an insect repellent along with your sunscreen, believe it or not, the effectiveness of the sunscreen is going to be reduced significantly by the uh, the insect repellent. So remember that and apply more often if you're using both at the same time. Okay. So prevention obviously is in all areas of medicine, we want to emphasize prevention. Mm -hmm. But someone didn't do it or forgot or didn't do an effective job with prevention, mm -hmm. just get really red and uncomfortable. What's some things that they can do for comfort? But take it beyond that in your, in your comments about when should someone worry about, you know, uh, something more serious. At what point is this something that might require something more than just um, local measures? Sure. 
So sunburns are typically just superficial burns. Uh, sunburns are just, you know, a fine erythema. It's uncomfortable. It feels, you know, a little uncomfortable when you touch it. Um, well, you, can, you can use, believe it or not, ibuprofen, simple ibuprofen or Tylenol uh, will do wonders for some of the discomfort. You know, I'm, I'm, there's a multitude of over-the-counter medications that you can use from, you know, aloe gels to uh, anesthetic gels that you can put uh, on the skin to help with the discomfort. Uh, certainly keeping any open wounds uh, clean, uh, making sure you're hydrating yourself enough because you're going to lose a lot of fluid through any type of burn that you have. Uh, is very important. So I would say it's pretty much comfort measures um, and uh, making sure that you stay well hydrated. Then you go into a little bit more serious of a burn when you get blisters. A lot of people come in uh, to the emergency department or the express care and they have uh, these large blisters. Now this is more of a partial thickness burn. It's gone a little bit more than just the, the superficial epidermis um, and uh, that needs to be treated a little bit differently in that you really need to stay hydrated. You need to push fluids because you're losing a lot of fluid through those blisters that are forming. And those blisters are at high risk to become infected, so you have to make sure that, that uh, you watch them very closely. So if they become more red or they get some like pussy, purulent material, they should really then seek attention for those. Absolutely. Okay, great. Anything else that we should cover on sunburns? Not that I can think of. No. Okay, all right. So um, you did skip over at the beginning, we briefly mentioned the dog bites and the cat bites and other animal bites, and I'm sure those happen more frequently, I'm guessing, in the summer months. Mm -hmm. well, what kind of things, well, again, assuming that someone doesn't have something that's a gashing wound that's bleeding that might need some kind of treatment, mm -hmm. um, well, let, no, let's talk about those. So, okay. so, okay. So, I like so, gashing. Yeah, I, I yeah. Like well, I was, gonna, I was gonna say that that was clear, but I don't think it's clear, because I immediately thought that, that there has been in, traditionally some controversy about the management of a large dog bite wound. So maybe you can just tell us about that. There are, so, so if you have a very large, if you have a bite wound from any type of, whether it's human, cat, dog, porcupine, you, you know, the, the mouths of these animals are fairly dirty. They have a lot of bacteria in there and you need to treat the wounds to make sure that these wounds don't become infected. It's an extreme example of what we were talking about with the mosquitoes and the ticks. Right. But the problem is those animals only have one germ. That we have thousands of them in our mouths and dogs similarly. So it's, it's, it's multiplied as a risk. A absolutely. So with any bite, you certainly want to uh, wash the wound very well. The problem with cats is that cats' teeth are almost like needles. Uh, needles. Yeah. So they almost inject the bacteria into the skin, skin heals over, traps that bacteria in there, so the infection spreads much more quickly and much more aggressively under the skin. So people get in a lot more trouble with cat bites, believe it or not, than dog bites, where your skin is actually torn and the bacteria has a chance to just uh, come out as you know the, the wound heals, heals and the things bleeding. Up, yes. Exactly. Uh -huh. uh, so typically, what I would do if somebody was bit by a dog, the general rule would be not to suture it up because you don't want to, just like we talked about the he skin healing over, you don't want to suture up bacteria that's buried in the skin. The larger these wounds are, obviously, if you have a flap of skin hanging off you know, your lower leg, you need to tack that down. We typically do you know, wash it out as well as we can, and we'll put in some very loose sutures, or what we'll do is do a delayed closure. We'll refer them to maybe a plastic surgeon, depending on where the area is, and say, we'll put you on antibiotics for a couple of days. We'll let this wound start healing a little bit, get that bacteria out of there and then we'll close it up when we think there's no more risk that there's going to be an infection. And of course, you know, tetanus status is very important. You want to make sure that your tetanus is up to date. You want to make sure that the animal that bit you is up to date on all its shots, including rabies, of course. Uh, and if the, uh, the animal is not up to date on its shots, as long as it can be watched for 10 to 14 days to make sure that it doesn't have any abnormal behaviors that would uh, suggest that it possibly could have rabies. Um, and... Uh, and that's about it. So you did mention uh, this issue that uh, I recall from years past about the cat bite or scratch and mm -hmm. the potential risk. What should somebody be mindful of if they felt like they had a cat bite? What symptoms should they be mindful of over the ensuing one to two weeks? I, the cat bites that I see are generally, I mean, granted, I, I see only people who are having troubles, but I would say if you're bit by a cat that was fa a fairly deep bite or you think it was a fairly deep bite, I think you should seek medical attention. I think that wound needs to be cleaned out with pressure. Usually use a little syringe and try to push fluids in there to flush it out a little bit. Sometimes we even make a little incision 
uh, we'll numb you up, of course, first, and then make a little incision and get that fluid in there to get that bacteria out of there. And we always like to put people on a prophylactic dose of antibiotics at least for five days to make sure that an infection doesn't set in. You know, a lot of the times with cat bites specifically, we see them on the hands and it's unfortunate the hands have all kinds of fascial planes underneath where these bacteria can kind of grow along underneath the skin very quickly. So somebody could get bit one day and a day later they could have redness all the way or pain up to their elbow. So uh, I think it's important to be seen quickly for these bites. Well, this was really a great review, but at the end I'm realizing that uh, we're, we just made summer not a very fun sounding uh, Sounds season. Sounds pretty dangerous. Yeah, <laughs> so let's just stay home and watch TV. No. That's definitely not the message of today's program. But I want to thank uh, Dr. Garrett Bamba from uh, PMA Express Care who reviewed some seasonal ideas on our program today called Bugs, Burns, and Barbecue. We didn't get to the barbecue, so that would have been fun. But we did talk about uh, a variety of things, and Dr. Bamba did a great job re re reviewing some uh, prevention and treatment strategies for mosquitoes, ticks, poison ivy, uh, sunburns, and dog and cat bites. So a lot of coverage, and uh, I think that uh, it was a really great review. So uh, hopefully uh, our audience has gotten some ideas about some things that they cannot worry about, some things that would be beneficial to seek attention for, and some uh, home strategies for management of these problems and, of course, prevention. So <clears throat> thank you again to Dr. Bamba. And uh, I would like to close by saying this has been Matters of the Heart on Haverhill Community Television, brought to you by Pateket Medical Associates and Haverhill Community Television. Thank you, and until next time, I'm Seth Belazarian. Thanks.